Do I have a pointer? Is there a pointer? I don't okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. My colleague and friend, Dr. Nadia Khan, who's a professor of medicine and general internal medicine. She's also a, a hypertension specialist and um, has uh, recently been working in the space of obesity medicine. And uh, today, the title of her talk is Therapeutics for Obesity, a Changing Paradigm. I'd like to also acknowledge that um, we are, the I, I am, and so are the, is the presenter, we're on the uh, traditional ancestral and um, unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil and we are grateful for their stewardship of the lands. And we are also committed to the TRC calls to action. And also the department is uh, committed to addressing the recommendations from the in-plane site report. Um, next uh, Grand Rounds presentation will be a VGH Division of General Internal Medicine. It'll be January 12th, 2023. I don't have the title, but we're looking forward to hearing uh, Dr. Nadia Khan present. And a final announcement I'd like to make is just to acknowledge and thank Dr. Sabina Freeman for being the St. Paul's Hospital Chief Medical Resident. She's done an outstanding job. So if we can give her a round of applause. Um, and we've given her a certificate and a token of our appreciation as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, uh, Dr. Khan, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Palapu. And as Dr. Palapu mentioned, I, I normally do hypertension. So what am I doing giving a talk on obesity? And really what happened was I realized that if I want to manage my patients with hypertension, I also needed to address obesity and obesity actually could lower the risks of their, or lower their, their blood pressure. So it was actually another treatment for me, for my hypertension patients. And like many of you that are tuned in or in the room, you might choose a different field, but probably your field would also benefit from uh, lowered risk from managing obesity. So I hope that this talk is relevant to you. So I, I also had a land acknowledgement, but I will just forego it as Dr. Palapu gave a really nice land acknowledgement. Um, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So this is actually um, a, a, a figure that was found in 2008 in Germany. And it's actually the first uh, figure uh, or figurine made by a human. And it dates 35,000 years ago. And this figure, including other prehistoric images, suggests that obesity has actually been around forever. Um, but probably the real difference is in the prevalence. So 35,000 years ago, it might have been quite uncommon, um, but now it's about 25% of all Canadians with an even male and female distribution. And then also we know that about 650 million people have obesity in, uh, in the world. And most of that has occurred in the last two to three decades. So what I'm hoping what we will do is discuss what is the current biological model underlying the development of obesity and what is the changing paradigm. And then looking at the effects of obesity on adiposity and the developments of adverse metabolic complications, and then to go over really what are the therapies. And these, even though they're listed as learning objectives, these are also the most common questions that I get from my patients with obesity. So the first question is why? Um, so when you look at these, th these people in the figure, if you ask maybe any of us or anyone on the, on the street, why do they have the appearance that they do? Probably people will say that they eat too much. And that would actually on the surface be very true. Um, but it really doesn't get at the deeper question of why do they eat? too much. So what are the causes of obesity? And I think we have really been focused on, um, it's a willpower issue. It's a prefrontal cortex issue. Um, it's just a matter of you eating the right thing and exercising, and then your obesity should be managed. Um, and there is some evidence to suggest that patients with obesity have less ability to have goal-directed behaviors. Um, but I think 
in large, this is not a major component. And then I think we can all agree that treatments targeting this issue of willpower are really not very effective. What about the next, which is now more recently discussed, which is our toxic food environment? I could give a whole day lecture on the toxic food environment, um, but I won't. Uh, the thing about the, the food environment is that it's quite complex. Um, there's issues of the built environment. Um, our occupations are more requiring seat, sitting as, as we are right now and probably in parts of our day. Um, the food that we're eating is actually highly palatable. So the food, the, the, the meals are not only larger, but the taste is even increased. High dense sugar, high fat foods are now widely available. And post pandemic, unfortunately, it's now even more available 24 seven availability. And this is part of our toxic environment. There are other issues at play as well, um, which go into issues of, of impulsivity, childhood traumas, other factors that are a part of the environment um, that we won't touch on. But again, it's a really important lecture. And I think that we can't ignore the fact that because obesity, the prevalence has increased so much in the last few decades, that this has to be playing a role. But perhaps what's the most important is this gut-brain connection. And this is something that we're only now recognizing in our patients. Uh, and I would argue that this is probably our best target. So this, I think, is the, probably the underlying more dominant cause. Um, you can see, um, if you walk down the street, you will see people of all various BMIs. So it's very heterogeneous. So why is one person completely impervious to this toxic food environment? Why is another person sitting with a BMI of 70? What is the difference? They're, they're, we're all living in this toxic food environment. What makes someone impervious and what makes someone susceptible? And I think that that's really the most important question for us. Um, so the biological basis really started out um, and heritability started out looking at twin studies as most of our um, heritability analyses for all chronic conditions are. And you can see here monozygotic twins almost identical body types. And yet dizygotic twins living in the same food environment, um, same upbringing probably, um, have very different body types. So this really lent the idea that obesity is very heritable. And the only thing more heritable than obesity is height. Um, so this is more heritable than coronary disease, more heritable than type two diabetes. Um, so it, it has a strong genetic basis. Um, this was an interesting um, analysis. This is the OBOB -OB mice. And OBOB -OB mice were just spontaneously found to be obese mice. And their BMI is about two to five times the average size of their litter mate to the mouse to the right. Um, and they found this spontaneous OBOB -OB mouse, and they found that there was only one single gene mutation, loss of function mutation in the OBOB -OB mice. And this again led to our understanding that there is probably a biological basis and a genetic underpinning. So the interesting thing about the OBOB -OB mice mouse is that that mouse eats uncontrollably. It also doesn't move very much. So if you were to watch a video, the other mouse is scampering around and the OBOB -OB mouse is not. So I think that that suggests that somehow our ability to exercise, our motivation to exercise may be tied into our genetic basis of food. So food is not in a vacuum or, or appetite and eating is not in a vacuum. Um, so, this, so this mouse then um, through reverse genetics, which I, I uh, by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Friedman at uh, Rockefeller University, identified what was that, that the, the functional protein that, that the OB, OB mouse was missing, and it's leptin. And leptin comes from the Latin word thin, uh, lap, leptose. So leptin proved to be really important. And this discovery was made in the 90s. And it really showed that leptin is produced in the adipose tissue and is proportionate to the adipose mass. And leptin actually is quite powerful and sends signals to the hypothalamus 
Um, it's very specific nuclei in the hypothalamus to target satiation. Um, leptin also, um, if you have low levels of leptin, your brain will think that it's starving. And you will see in people that, or in, in mice that are leptin deficient or the OB-OB mouse, um, not only has difficulty with with wanting to constantly eat and store their food, they're also more likely to be hypothyroid, uh, more likely to be tachycardic, and more likely to have hypogonadism. So it's sort of more of a starvation response. Um, what about humans? So in 2002, um, there was this uh, family in the UK, they were consanguinous, um, and they had a child and the child was born of normal BMI, um, but they noted right away had insatiable hunger. And the child um, gained 20 kilos in the first year of life. Um, they also had another cousin um, who was older and weighed, age eight, weighed 200 pounds. Um, this child um, basically would eat 2,000 calories in a meal and still want to eat more would cry out, would really have a lot of food seeking behaviors. And so the parents took them in to see the endocrinologist and the endocrinologist, Dr. Faruqi and um, O'Rafili, um, thought, could this be like the OB-OB mouse? And certainly at that time, they evaluated for leptin levels and found that this patient was entirely leptin deficient. So then they gave this child leptin um, and that's what he looked like several years later. And even within several doses, the child went from consuming 2,000 calories a day to more like 200, sorry, 2,000 calories per meal to 200 calories per meal, which is more of a normal amount just with, within a few doses. Um, they interestingly also did some functional MRI studies in these in this, this family of, of children. And they found that Prior to giving the child leptin, if they showed them images of what I would say was unpalatable food like broccoli or cauliflower, um, their, their mesolimbic area would light up and their hypothalamus would light up. And then if you showed them something that's very palatable, it would also light up. Um, if you showed them a, a car, it would not light up. Um, and then after giving leptin, um, then they would not light up for broccoli and cauliflower, but their functional MRI would light up for chocolate cake. So what this suggests though, is something that we don't really think of, which is that our biology is controlling our liking of food. Um, people are not necessarily, these genetics and these proteins aren't necessarily causing obesity per se, they're causing behaviors that cause obesity. So the wanting of food, the eating of food, the feeling of hunger is what these proteins are coding for. So this was really a fascinating um, exploration into the, uh, the role of monogenic obesity. Um, so what about the garden variety or common obesity, which we're thinking of as more polygenic? So we looked at leptin levels. This was the most promising avenue. Um, and we actually found that, not surprisingly, because leptin is released from fat tissue or adipose tissue, that these patients with polygenic obesity had high leptin levels. So no matter how much leptin you gave them, it didn't change their weight. So they were actually already leptin resistant. So you can think of it just exactly like you think of insulin resistance, how insulin is not very effective in an insulin resistant patient. Leptin proves to not be significant for a leptin resistant patient. But even though this was um, a partial discovery in that it's helped you know, all the monogenic forms of uh, the, the leptin deficiency forms, the lipodystrophy patients, the leptin deficient patients, and those are honestly less than 100 people around the world. Um, it didn't really have as much of an impact for polygenic obesity. But what it did do is really open the door to say there's a biological basis. And this pivotal, this pivotal analysis and these pivotal discoveries led to further analyses of looking at the leptin pathway. And looking at the leptin pathway, um, there were several other areas, POMC, 
um, and uh, the proprio the the melanocortico um, site for receptor MC4R have been proven other areas of deficiencies, and now there are newer treatments that are available for people with these deficiencies. And one actually just published in the Lancet last week um, for people with MC4R deficiencies. So that's for monogenic obesity. Um, we're estimating that about 5% of children that are quite obese before the age of 10 may also have an MC4R deficiency. And some guidelines would recommend that we start genetic testing for children with obesity. We actually don't do that here in Canada, but I think this is an avenue, even looking for leptin deficiency that we should be looking at. And really what it did is open up the um, our understanding and exploration of what is governing appetite. And this is homeostatic uh, system. And without going into too much detail, the basic is, is that adipose tissue, insulin, are long-term energy storage, and they send signals to a specific um, set of neurons, two sets of neurons in the hypothalamus. One is called the POMC neurons. The other is called the agouti-related protein, uh, that neurons that code for agouti-related peptides. These these neurons will control either hunger or satiation, almost in a yin and yang pattern. Um, they're controlled by leptin, but they're also controlled minute to minute by gut hormones. And those include GIP, GLP-1 that we know about, uh, amylin, um, cholecystokinin, and others. In fact, there are 37 of these peptides that are discovered so far. Um, not all of them are yet therapeutic targets, but you can imagine that they will be eventually. But they go in and they regulate. If you've got food in your stomach, then ghrelin levels will fall. And then GLP, once it hits the colon, uh, GLP and GIP will be released. And so you'll increase satiation. If your stomach is empty, ghrelin gets released and it'll actually trigger the, um, the uh, agouti-related proteins and trigger hunger. They also work with another pathway, which is called the mesolimbic pathway. And I think at St. Paul's, we always think of the mesolimbic pathway as the reward circuit in addictions, but actually a very similar pathway is set up for uh, food issues. And um, basically this, this uh, mesolimbic system is actually adjacent to the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus can receive and also send signals to this mesolimbic area. And let me just tell you that it's controlling things like uh, liking, wanting, and learning. And so just to give you an example, suppose one day um, you're finished dinner, so you've eaten, you're actually technically full, you're satiated, um, but you decide to go sit on the couch and watch TV with a loved one. And at that time, someone says, why don't we eat these chocolate brownies while we're watching a movie? And so you all sit there on the couch. It's really cozy. You're eating brownies. You're watching a favorite movie. Your dopamine levels have suddenly gone up. And what happens is this, this whole pattern gets tagged with dopamine and it goes to the amygdala as an emotional memory. So the next day you're eating dinner, you felt really good. You ate dinner, you're full, you're fine. You actually don't need to eat. You look at the couch and the environmental cue of the couch triggers, oh, I usually sit here after dinner about an hour later and I sit and I eat something and that all feels good and I want to repeat it. And it gets repeated day after day after day. And this is the mesolimbic pathway. And then if we eat something like brownies, it felt so good. Uh, food, the brownies itself tasted really good. So intrinsically it's likable, but also the fact that I was sitting with a loved one, really enjoying myself that one time, that all comes into that feeling of learning and wanting. Um, these two systems are actually interlinked. Um, so homeostatic mechanisms um, also interplay and all the treatments that we're gonna talk about today also work on both systems. Um, there's also um, epigenetics and metabolic imprinting, which I find really fascinating. Um, this, this type of, this line of research is still in its infancy, but it suggests that in um, 
rat models, for example, if you um, feed them a high fat, high sugar diet, um, salty snacks during pregnancy and lactation, their children will want to also have high sugar, high fat, and they're more likely to be obese. That's metabolic imprinting. They also looked at epigenetic factors. So if you fed a rat um, or a mouse uh, a high fat diet, um, they also can have increased DNA methylation. Um, and that also is associated with higher BMI. The good thing about epigenetics is it can be reversed. So you can actually uh, train that rat or mouse to then not get used to a regular diet, and then you will no longer have that DNA methylation. But it really does suggest that there is a strong biological basis. So that's really, I hope, showing you um, that the biological basis of obesity is quite powerful and an important target. Um, I just want to talk about another issue, which I find people um, sort of a newer thought, another paradigm shift, which is adipose tissue. We have white adipose tissue and white adipose tissue um, is really how much you have, how many cells you have, um, your number of cells, your location and amount uh, on your body and the distribution is probably governed by your genetics as well. And if you think of this adipose tissue as it's a healthy storage for triglycerides, so it stores your triglycerides, making it readily available. It doesn't require water, so it's very lightweight. So it's actually uh, a healthy reservoir. And if you um, happen to have enough of these adipose cells or adipocytes, then probably when you expand your adipose tissue, um, your body or your reservoir can withstand it. Um, and normally adipose will accommodate increasing and decreasing levels, either through increasing adipocyte numbers. So the myth that you're born with all the adipocyte cells that you have at birth is not true. Uh, you actually generate adipocytes um, all throughout your life. And also they can swell. They can in fact swell at least five times to 10 times the size that they're originally starting out as. Um, but importantly, adipocytes have pleiotropic effects. The problem is, is there are adipocyte or white adipose tissue reservoir is not finite. Um, in the context of obesity and a positive energy balance, you can outstrip your, your storage capacity of your white adipose tissue. So your adipocytes swell and swell and swell until the vasculature can no longer support the degree of swelling. And when that happens, you, in, you cause tissue hypoxia. And the tissue hypoxia is the signal that causes several things. One is it causes pro-inflammatory cytokines and interleukins to be released. Um, it also causes difficulty with insulin signaling glucose uptake and releases adiponectin. And also importantly, it, the overfilling or over expansion ultimately causes ectopic fat production or adipose deposition. And that's usually at the viscera, which is usually the problem. And this process uh, is called adiposopathy. So you can have obese patients or patients with obesity, and they actually have normal uh, they're actually healthy. They're metabolically healthy. So you'll see some patients, they're 30 years old. Their BMI is 40. They have no diabetes, no hypertension, no dyslipidemia, and no liver enzyme abnormalities, no hepatic steatosis. They are metabolically healthy. They are within their adipose tissue reservoir. And then you have some people whose BMI is 30, and yet they have type 2 diabetes, and they have um, hypertriglyceridemia, et cetera. And you can understand that those patients, their reservoir was not large enough, um, or there's a defect with their ability to generate ad new adipocytes to accommodate this extra triglyceride. So you can see here that because of this, we get a whole host of issues. Um, I think everybody knows what the, the complications of, of adiposopathy is. And that's what we used to say was obesity. Obesity causes mechanical dysfunction. Adiposopathy causes all the issues with type 2 diabetes, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, asthma, 
hepatic steatosis, malignancies. So those are all of the sort of factors that come from adiposopathy. And the reason why I bring it up today is because it's also a target. So let's shift to the final question, which is how do we treat this now that we have a better understanding of the biological basis? So this was Hippocrates' advice even over 2,000 years ago. And at that time, Hippocrates said, reduce food and avoid drinking, exercise regularly, run during the night and take an early morning walk. And I would say that that's still our advice today, unfortunately, even though I think in our heart of hearts, most of us feel that it's not very effective. So again, I think that because it's not an effective therapy, it doesn't mean that we abandon this, but it means we really should shift our minds to more effective targets. Um, so I'm just going to touch on this. This is Orlistat. It's a lipase inhibitor, not widely used, um, expensive, um, has lots of side effects because it's a peripheral mechanism. Lipase inhibitor causes patients to have a lot of oily stools. So it's not very easy to use, but in the Zendos trial was associated with at, um, year one at 10 kilo weight loss. Um, but it, people couldn't tolerate it. Um, you have to take it three times a day. And I have not one patient that can take it three times a day. I barely can have people taking it once a day. Um, another treatment is bupropion naltrexone, which is under the trade name Contrave. And this um, bupropion naltrexone work on the dopamine and opioid receptors, which are part of the mesolimbic pathway that I showed you was involved in liking and wanting. Um, and so this treatment was studied in the core trials, and it did show actually, um, regardless of what patients say, so they didn't have to say, I'm craving food. It was all comers with obesity. Um, it did show that it was effective at reducing weight, um, and it also improved quality of life and patient self-esteem. Um, again, at 56 weeks of therapy, only 50% were on it. I find in clinical practice, people cannot tolerate naltrexone. Um, so it is another treatment option for us, but I think the one that is really, uh, quite effective, which I think all of you are probably using is the GLP one, uh, receptor analog. And this really works again on both mechanisms. It's mostly, uh, in the, in the hypothalamus, um, increasing the, the palm C, uh, satiation signals. It also has an effect on uh, gastric emptying. It delays gastric emptying um, and it has insulin effects, but they're glucose dependent. So if your glucose is not elevated, it has less insulinotropic effects. The scale obesity trials um, were a study with liraglutide compared with placebo. And this showed that, um, this showed that, um, that liraglutide was effective at losing, at helping patients lose weight on average, about 8% weight loss with liraglutide. Um, the scale obesity and prediabetes study also showed reduction in A1C, reduction in systolic and diastolic blood pressures, small increase in heart rate, but reduction in your improvement in your lipid profile. Uh, most patients do get not most, sorry, a minority of patients do get side effects, but mostly side effects dissipate within the first three months. In rat models, there was an increased risk of medullary thyroid cancer, but not in humans. And uh, liraglutide has been available on the market for use for well over a decade. And there's been really no human signals of increased cancer. Um, across the different scale trials that have been studied in patients with prediabetes, diabetes, sleep apnea, and maintenance, they all see about a 7% or so weight loss with liraglutide. Um, and that was the nausea uh, analysis. And then, um, so the scale extension trial uh, looked at the same patients and did they progress to diabetes at three years? And so these patients actually showed that even after three years, there was a much less risk of developing diabetes if you were given a GLP-1 analog compared to those um, who did not receive it. So quite effective in changing your metabolic uh, future. 
Um, when we looked at um, weight loss after three years of follow-up, uh, similarly, um, patients maintained a lot of their weight loss, which is very different from diet and exercise, where you'll see people have weight cycling. Interestingly, if patients stop their GLP, then they started to regain their weight. And again, we're not really controlling or altering their, their um, homeostatic mechanisms. It's really just controlling at the time. So really you can get almost a complete return to baseline weight if you stop the medication. Um, semaglutide now, uh, which I think is what most people are using. Um, this was in the step one trial that was just published last year. And that looked at semaglutide uh, at different doses compared to placebo in patients without diabetes, but who had obesity based on BMI or a, a BMI of 27 plus one weight related complication. And then um, they lost on average 15% with about 2.4 milligrams of, of uh, semaglutide. So a pretty impressive weight loss with semaglutide treatment that was also quite durable. Again, they still have the same complications of side effect rates. They have increased gallbladder disease. Uh, there is some signal for increased pancreatitis. So patients generally that have pancreatitis, you may wish to be more careful or not use in pancreatitis. Again, non-significant increased risk of cancer. Um, gallbladder disease actually also happens in people that have bariatric surgery. So it's more likely due to weight loss than it is the GLP-1 analog on its own. Um, so there is a beneficial effect for weight loss in patients with obesity and diabetes or no diabetes. And the benefits of this were seen in trials that also included regular monitoring and food intake and exercise. If we look though at the amount of monitoring people are getting in a trial, they're getting at least three months monitoring. And there is data to suggest that monthly or Q6 weeks monitoring is associated with more weight loss than at larger or longer intervals. Um, food intake on its own, if you look at meta-analyses, shows that you've got about a 5% reduction in weight loss, uh, but there's really no specific diet that's superior to the other. So all of these trials use sort of a generic uh, healthy diet um, and and exercise recommendations were following standard American guidelines. Um, exercise itself is associated with maybe a one to 2% weight loss. So exercise doesn't on its own induce weight loss. It's more for weight maintenance. So for certainly some of that close monitoring, um, dietary recommendations and uh, regular exercise probably played a role in the maintenance of their weight of patients' weight loss. Um, they were also receiving counseling to talk about um, as adherence as well. And we all know adherence is a major problem, as you saw in these earlier trials, but also um, in all patients that are on chronic disease management. So we actually looked at our own data um, of 550 patients in our clinic, and we looked at what's the maximum total body weight loss. And you can see here, it's very heterogeneous. Um, that there are some people that are non-responders who have less than 5% response to weight loss drugs. And yet there are some patients that are hyper responders that have more than 20% uh, weight loss. And you see even a few that have reached the 30% weight loss, Thir 25 to 30% weight loss is what you expect with bariatric surgery. So there clearly are, are some people that benefit greatly from a GLP-1 agonist and yet others that don't. And we don't really know why there is that heterogeneity. Some of it may be due to different dosing. Not everybody can afford Ozempic, um, but clearly there is some difference in individuals that we don't fully understand um, why some people respond and other people do not. We also tried to analyze, are there clinical predictors of response to GLP-1 analogs? And we actually found that we could not predict who would respond and who wouldn't uh, based on regular clinical characteristics. And this suggests to us that we probably are missing an appropriate, precise biomarker. 
And there are studies looking at GLP-1 levels, but those in and of themselves, because GLP-1 is degraded within minutes, is not a very useful target either. So we don't quite have a biomarker to understand which patient should be on which drug. Uh, the only thing we really can do is try patients on these treatments and see if they have a response. Um, and so we often get asked, well, at the time we're giving people their medications, they've lost 10% of their weight. And then they, they say, we're really happy, but we want to lose another 10% of weight. And then you've sort of maxed out on what you can do with your therapies. So one idea is to model obesity or weight loss the same way you would a hypertension clinic, which is using multiple different strategies and multiple different drugs. So that's not really been studied before. And we had an opportunity to study that. Uh, what would happen if you took someone who's already on a GLP-1 analog and added bupropion naltrexone combination to that? So you can see that um, the blue are everybody who's on a GLP-1 analog. The red are the people that don't respond to GLP-1 analogs, but you also gave them, you also gave them um, a, a second drug, which was the, the contrave. And then the green line is perhaps the most interesting, which is the people that responded to GLP-1, if you also added uh, naltrexone bupropion, you got an additional weight loss suggesting that stacking is very important. And you can see here in this analysis as well, that if we added, if you see here, actually, let me just show you. If you see in the bottom, um, the bottom two columns on the lower right, the middle and the, the left, that's additional weight loss that you achieve with adding a second drug so you can see if you were just using GLP-1 analog on its own, the average response is 10% weight loss. Whereas if you add a second drug, um, then you're going to get a higher amount of weight loss, which is more like 12, 13%. So you, you actually get an additional benefit from being on additional drug. So what's next? Um, there's a new drug that has just gotten Health Canada approval in the last few weeks. It's called terzepatide. And terzepatide is also has GLP-1 analog, but also has a GIP receptor agonist. And GIP is a glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. And they tried giving GIP directly interventricularly to rats and they, or these, these uh, obese mice, um, diet-induced obese mice. And they found that if they gave this to these obese mice, that the mice would stop eating or they would reduce their intake. They would stop drinking fluids as well. Um, and they would increase their activity, but they wouldn't change their grooming behaviors. So we felt it didn't change your personality, even though it's working in the in the, in the uh, hypothalamus area, um, but it had an effect on eating and drinking. And I think drinking is very interesting given there's a huge increase in sugar sweetened beverages. So it might be an additional type of, of target um, as well. But perhaps one of the more interesting things about GIP that GLP does not have is the effect on the white adipose tissue. So we just talked about adiposopathy and actually GIP has been shown to actually improve the efficiency of, of um, lipid metabolism inside the white adipose tissue. So actually there's reduction in adipose tissue stores. And this has now become a very interesting target because it might also be an answer for um, hepatic uh, NASH, uh, hepatic steatosis. Um, so it's got this additional adipose tissue target. And because of that, it's reducing pro-inflammatory immune markers as well. So there's potentially increased benefit from this. So the surmount trial was um, published in uh, the summer of 2022, and it was a, a, a randomized control trial of 2,500 patients with a BMI of 30 or higher. Um, and they did not include people with diabetes. And they gave them varying doses of terzepatide or placebo for about 1.4 years. 
And they looked at the percentage change in weight from baseline and a reduction in weight of 5% more, which is what is sort of universally standard response. And they showed pretty dramatic reductions in weight. So they actually found that with a high dose for 15 milligrams of trisepatide, they almost had a 21% total body weight loss. And again, as I mentioned, bariatric surgery is 25 to 30%. Um, and they certainly even had some patients that were above 25% and some patients above 30%. So really very close to bariatric surgery numbers. And this is just the GIP GLP combination. So you can imagine if you were then to stack on another agent like Contra, for example, you'd have an additional lowering. Um, so again, there was significant reduction um, in change in, in body weight. Importantly, um, there was improved physical function, reduced lipid profile, improved lipid profile, reduced blood pressure. That was actually quite significant. Um, at the highest level, you could reduce your blood pressure by seven millimeters of mercury, which is almost similar to a, a single antihypertensive drug. Um, and a diastolic reduction by four, which is again similar to a, a single um, antihypertensive medication. So, really effective. Uh, body composition. So, we talked about the effect of GIP on fat mass and how adiposopathy is such a huge underlying driver of the complications. So, fat mass also was reduced significantly with adding on a GIP drug. So, needless to say, um, People are very interested in this medication. Unfortunately, the side effects are higher than GLP-1 alone. So you do get an increasing amount of intolerance and there's mostly GI, not surprising given that incretins work on the GI tract. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential for future therapies. So the, the, the pharmaceutical company that makes uh, the, this um, terzepatide is going to be studying the same drug in patients with NASH, um, in patients with heart disease, so we'll get cardiovascular endpoint data, um, as well as patients that don't have obesity but just are overweight. Um, they're also going to study it around the world in the Asia Pacific, in Japan, and in China as well to make sure that the therapies are globally applicable. And then there's newer treatments on the horizon. One is a is a GGG triple therapy, which is glucagon, GIP, GLP-1 analog, which should be even more robust. Amylin agonists, which I showed you, amylin is another uh, therapeutic target, um, but this time from the pancreas. Um, and then other factors. And actually, there's too many to show you that are in the pipeline for obesity, all looking at this this homeostatic model. Um, just to close, um, I thought I would just tell you about one patient that I had. Um, I met this young, young girl, we'll call her Amy, and she was about 23 when I met her. And she worked at McDonald's and she had severe obesity. Her BMI was about 45. Um, she had severe depression and anxiety. Um, to the point where she had multiple suicide attempts, multiple hospitalizations, really refractory depression. Her psychiatrist worked very long and hard and after many years um, got her on a cocktail of medications that allowed her to function. So they asked her to see us to, to look at this. We first diagnosed her with an uh, eating disorder that I didn't talk about. It's called binge eating disorder. So we started her on, on treatment for binge eating disorder. She lost weight with that treatment. Once we had controlled her binge eating disorder, then we shifted to start her on a GLP-1 analog. Luckily, she McDonald's has fantastic healthcare coverage, and she got to the full dose of GLP-1 analog. Um, she still wanted more weight loss. We added on Contrave. In total, she lost about 35% of her total body weight. But I think what's really interesting about this, so she went from a BMI maybe in the high 40s to high 30s. She still has obesity, but in that time, she also um, 
got a new partner, she went back to school and got her master's degree and got promoted at McDonald's to like manager. So she really thrived. And I get a lot of patients that say that just being on these medications stops my obsessive thoughts about eating. As I showed you earlier with the leptin deficient children, just the anything, any sight of food, which there's constantly environmental triggers, it's always ever present occupying their, their brain, occupying their prefrontal cortex, their subconscious, uh, mesolimbic, their brainstem area, their midbrain. It's always ever present. And so many of my patients say that I just don't have those thoughts and it just freed up my mind. And I don't think that it's just that this lady, this young lady, um, just lost some weight and now is feeling good about herself. I actually think it's freed up her mind so she can focus on other things in her life. Um, so she actually had a tremendous response. Um, unfortunately, she got so overwhelmed. People were so happy with her. She took on so many things. They kept giving her more and more work at McDonald's. So she stopped taking her medications. And then she regained about 75 pounds. Um, and so now we're restarting this process. But you can see, you know, we're not there yet, but you can see what kind of a difference it can make for your patients. Um, it can be very much a game changer. And you can think of a world where we don't have obesity anymore, or it's very uncommon. And I think in this lifetime, we're going to see tremendous strides in obesity management. We're already seeing tremendous strides, but I think the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to see tremendous strides. So if I could leave you with these, these closing implications for this, for this data, I think obesity, we should stop thinking of it as uh, a willpower issue. That's just too minor. And the therapeutic target is, is not good enough. I think we really should focus on the, the biologic targets. Um, it's a complex disease um, and homeostasis is a critical component. Um, and then the other is to think of obesity patients or patients with obesity as whether or not they have adiposopathy or not. If they have adiposopathy, it's really important to be aggressive with pharmacotherapy. Um, obesity, you can as well, but adiposopathy is what you're really looking for in your patients. Um, new treatment options should emphasize the biological model um, as our main source, incretin therapies and other targets of the, the um, homeostasis model are going to be critical. We need more research to look at why are some people non-responders, hyper-responders. We need to identify biomarkers for more precision targeted therapy and really look at more additional therapeutic targets, including thermogenesis and looking at our adipocyte reservoirs. Thank you very much. Are you yes. Um, thank you for the talk. It was wonderful. Um, has has anybody looked at those people that don't gain that that can eat whatever they want? Uh, Excellent. And, and everybody has a friend. Everybody like, hates them. Everybody yeah. hates them. Yeah. Uh, um, it, and, it's, they get, and have they been studied? This brilliant, brilliant question. Actually, they are just now being studied for exactly the same reason you're saying. Like, what is it? that makes those people completely impervious and they can be on a high, high fat, high sugar diet, and they don't gain any weight. So now the, the, the people that I mentioned, um, this doctor right here, Dr. Um, Faruqi is now studying the, the very thin population. Um, the people with low BMIs that seem to be able to eat, consume quite a few calories to see if they can understand what are the, what are the biological underpinnings, but that's a brilliant idea. Anna? Dr. Romani, sorry. That, that was amazing. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, it was fascinating to see that a single protein can manage so much behavioral change. So I guess I was curious as to if there are any other research looking at, for example, emotional response where people um, under emotional circumstances stop eating, whereas others become heavy eaters. Like, And has there been any uh, ideas around what what that looks like in terms of at the level of the protein. Yeah. I think that's really fascinating. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, because obesity is so complex, you have to think about the emotions, <coughs> 
as well and stressors. There's been lots of studies actually that have just simply looked at BMI levels and they find that children, for example, that have stressful events, have early childhood stressful events, um, they have increased BMI and whether or not that translates into differences with um, GLP levels or leptin levels isn't isn't yet studied, but I think that's a really fantastic um, a fantastic idea. The 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 there is definitely a correlation between emotion and weight gain. And what unfortunately happens is that when patients have these adverse childhood events or traumas at some point in their life, and you'll often see if you ask patients why did you gain weight, they'll say. I was a certain weight and then I got into a car accident and then I gained weight and I've never been able to stop since then. So what we see actually is all of these kinds of traumas, physical, emotional, et cetera, traumas, or even just having a period of your life where you consume a high fat diet. And and sometimes it's through emotional eating, um, raises your set point. And then suddenly your homeostatic mechanisms are now defending a higher set point. And they, you cannot drop back down. And that's typically what we see. Uh, and emotion is, uh, emotion is definitely a driver. Great. Dr. Gador. Thank you for that talk. Very uh, excellent overview of the physiology. Um, I suppose for those, uh, and I never really had an understanding of the concept of uh, uh, adisopathy, but uh, what about for the patients that are relatively lean um, peripherally, but then you really don't have, other than through imaging, I guess, a way to identify those with uh, visceral fat. Um, so let's say their BMI doesn't detect obesity or overweight, but they have, would you be using these therapies in patients with you know, non-alcoholic <clears throat> fatty liver? And Yeah, I think, I think one thing is if your BMI is 27, so in these studies, if your BMI was 27 and you had, say, you had NASH, you could start on this therapy. So I think that that is a good idea. And so far the data just for NASH, not looking at terzepatide yet, but shows that delays the progression of, of, of NASH, the degree of steatosis. I think that's where we're going next with the looking at terzepatide in NASH patients with or without like the BMI definition of obesity. Um, I think this is going to be actually a very interesting target and a and a good therapy to, to start on. So I think that's coming. Uh, for me personally, I have a low threshold for starting people on this, these agents, but generally at least a BMI of 27. And it's true the detection of NASH is, is difficult. We can use ALT for screening. It's not overly sensitive. Um, imaging a little bit better. Um, and then fiber scan ultimately to see the degree. But but we really don't have a good recognition of adiposopathy. But as soon as you start seeing somebody with metabolic disease, blood pressure starting to go up, impaired fasting glucose, you know you're on that path. Like that's what the process is. So I think that there is this now study looking even at terzepatide early in the, the day of diagnosis of, of diabetes. So this concept of for diabetes that the earlier you intervene, can you actually create a legacy effect and change that patient's outcome, even a short blast of treatment, that's also going to be looked at. Any other questions? Sorry, Jacon, I said a, a sure question. Um, so I know you touched on like uh, white adipose tissue in, in, in patients. And I know there was like a lot of excitement before on, on brown adipose tissue in patients and how it's a lot more metabolically active. And if there's like some clinical utility in that area. I'm just yeah. wondering where that kind of stands right now from yeah. your perspective and if that's an area that's being explored as well. Yeah, that that is a great point. Um, there is brown adipose tissue and beige adipose tissue. And um, in humans, we have a very limited store of brown adipose tissue, unlike animal models that have large reservoirs mm-hmm. of brown adipose tissue. And they the thing about brown adipose tissue is it's involved in thermogenesis. So it's actually heat producing so it's actually a very good target. So there is these studies that are trying to look at mitochondrial change to see if we can brown white adipose tissue. Um, I don't know that that's going to, I think that's going to be quite tricky because some of the work at the mitochondrial level, you could see you could have off target implications, but this line of, of looking at the adipose reservoir and adiposopathy is a new target. And interestingly, 
obesity impairs your brown adipocyte function. So it dysregulates your brown adipose tissue. So it makes your brown adipose tissue less effective. Yes, Anna. Dr. Mani? Do you anticipate that we're not going to offer any more um, surgeries until patients have had a good 18 months of therapy, pharmacotherapy? I, I personally believe that we will we will see less and less surgery. Um, I think with these treatments, I mean, already you've probably heard of the worldwide shortage of, of Ozempic and there's probably going to be a worldwide shortage of terzepatide because we have 650 million people that need to be on the medication and probably more. Um, I think one day we will not have bariatric surgery. It's very much like, it's very much like where hypertension was in the 1950s, where we're just starting to develop ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers. And we're no longer doing like renal sympathetic um, denervation because it seems like a crude way of managing a, a, a treatment that would be medically managed. So I, I think the future is medication therapy and very few indications for surgery. And I think we're also going to find more and more monogenic forms. So I think when we think of polygenic disease, they're probably not all polygenic. In any given individual, they probably have monogenic, maybe explaining 25% of their obesity, and then polygenic explaining 75. It's not just necessarily all or one. So as I showed you before, I had a patient that this, our patient, Amy, who had a 30% weight loss with a GLP-1 analog. I can't help but think that she actually has a mutation somewhere along her GLP-1 pathway. And that's why she's had such a dramatic response. Um, and that's why there's response differences and such dramatic ones that there's monogenic differences that we're going to identify more and more. And we are identifying more all the time and new treatment targets. Any other questions? I think it's an exciting area. I encourage almost everybody to start treating your patients for obesity, whatever your problems are that you're looking after probably will get better with managing your, your obesity. Thank you. Thank you.